Good morning and happy Mother's Day, everyone. Today we're going to be uh, looking to one of the famous mothers of the Bible uh, in a message that I suppose I would entitle Life Lessons from the Heart of Hannah, whom we read about in the book of 1 Samuel, uh, chapter 1. Oops, I lost my way here. 1 Samuel chapter 1, beginning with the ninth verse. Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. And then she went her way and ate something and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning they arose and worshiped before the Lord and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You could say that Mother's Day first began as a worship service in a Methodist church before it was a national holiday in the United States. Long before the second Sunday of May was made official by President Woodrow Wilson in 1914, Anna Jarvis organized the service at Andrews Methodist Episcopal Church in Grafton, West Virginia in 1908 to honor her mother, Anne Reeves Jarvis, and all mothers everywhere. Her mother helped to care for wounded soldiers in the Civil War and wanted to call attention to health issues as well as a peace movement to end the loss of husbands and sons as casualties of war. Later, when the holiday gained momentum and became more commercialized, founder Anna Jarvis protested the movement, arguing that Mothers should be given handwritten letters of love and appreciation rather than purchase gifts or greeting cards. I'm particularly aware of another mother from West Virginia today as our very own director of children's ministry, Sarah Stewart, is at home and about due to have her first baby boy any time now. So our prayers are with our sister Sarah For many today is a day when they receive signs of love and appreciation in different ways from those who have received their care as a mother or a mother figure in their life. Now, for some of you, your presence here this morning in person or together with them online uh, may be a gift to them too. And we are glad you are with us today. There is joy in seeing Christian faith continue from one generation to another. 2 Timothy 1.5 says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. 
There's also the scripture that says, raise your children in the ways of the Lord, and when they grow old, they will not depart from it. I always wondered, does that mean it's not going to happen until they grow old? And sometimes that's the way it works. For still others who, like me, had to say goodbye to their mothers long ago, today brings back memories of growing up or maybe more recent memories uh, with their mothers that are bittersweet in a way. For we realize that we wouldn't be who we are without them and are thankful for their lifetime of loving and giving, sharing and serving, listening and encouraging, and yes, at times, even disciplining. We also miss them and the kind of opportunities that we had when they were still with us on this side of the curtain of the glory of heaven. And sometimes a picture or a song or even a smell can take us back to formative memories that we may share with our mothers. I brought something with us, uh, with me today from home way back. It's a block of wood. And it could be a demonstration of my power and karate skills, <laughs> but sadly it is not. It is just a block of wood uh, that came from the home I grew up in. And now my mother has uh, passed away 13 years ago, but I remember this wood because it was on the kitchen island countertop that we simply called the butcher block. It was known to me for many great meals and shared family fellowship that happened around that kitchen space. It was often covered with flour because my mother loved to bring joy uh, to her family through the many things that she baked, uh, especially apple pies that are at the very top of my personal favorites list. And I'll just offer an apology in advance if I get a little emotional in places uh, here sharing about my family. Um, it seems like the older I get, the more emotional I get. And it may be even more for pastors who see all of the experiences of life. I think maybe that's why uh, Christian author Leonard Sweet entitled his book on preaching called Giving Blood. It feels like that sometimes. Uh, there was a lot of life lessons learned around this butcher block. It wasn't just the words that were shared around it. It was the kind of loving and inclusive environment that she created. Proverbs 27.10 says, Do not forsake your friend or friend of your family, and do not go to your relative's house when disaster strikes you. Better a neighbor nearby than a relative far away. These friends didn't just come over when disaster struck. They came over into our kitchen all the time. And our home was one where even adults without children found a bigger family or even a youth without a mother found another one. My family must have saved a lot of money on haircuts growing up because my mom's best friend, Debbie Evans, offered once to cut our hair. Mine, my older brother, and my younger sister, and somehow that turned into a years-long standing arrangement with schedules that spread throughout the whole year. And when we think of all of the soccer games and tennis matches that we had growing up and seeing our mother up there in the stands or on the sidelines, Debbie was right there with her almost all of the time. And this was the case, folks, even with that snow flying in the Syracuse air. Uh, it's no wonder then that in the picture slideshow of my sister's I, graduation or wedding reception, I don't remember which, there was a picture of Debbie in there with the words, my second mom. Debbie taught us that you don't have to be a mother to be a mother figure or to be a part of a family. 
in our scripture reading for today, this was not Hannah's initial experience, however. Her husband Elkanah had another wife, Peninnah, who had children, but Hannah did not. At the time in that culture, it was common for husbands to have more than one wife, and it would be difficult to fully communicate how significant the ability to have children was to women, to their families, and to society. As if the circumstances were not bad enough by themselves, sometimes there was rivalry present between women who could have children and those who could not, which made matters even worse. Sometimes the world is not only broken, at times it can be cruel. Each year, when Hannah would go to the house of the Lord for the annual sacrifice, her hopes would rise, and each time what Scripture names as her rival in verse 7 uh, says provoked her to irritate her, which could be another way of saying penina anonymously. The Hebrew word for rival is tsarah, with one letter difference from the name Sarah, which we recall involved another rivalry between uh, two women, one who could have children and the other could not, Sarah and Hagar. You may remember the Lord heard Hagar's cry and her son's cry, and in his mercy sent an angel of the Lord to speak to her. In fact, this is the first time in the whole Bible where an angel of the Lord spoke to anybody at all, and it was a desperate uh, young mother. And Hagar called the Lord El Roi, or the God who sees. Now likewise, the Lord heard and had mercy upon Hannah as well when she cried out to him too. Verse 11 says, And she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, But give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. Later, she was told by the priest Eli that she would, in fact, receive what she had asked of the Lord and conceive and bear a son. And when her son was born, she named him Samuel, which sounds like the Hebrew word heard by God. Shema, as in the Shema, hear, O Israel, to hear, and then El, the word for God. Friends, the mothers of Scripture here in the Old Testament are telling us something really important. They're telling us that our God is a God who sees and a God who hears and reaches out in mercy to those who cry out to him. Hannah's example before us in 1 Samuel teaches us several other valuable life lessons as well, which I'm going to try to move through very quickly. Long before Hannah became a mother, she was a very devout person of faith. For many years, she was faithful in that yearly trip to the Lord's house for sacrifices and prayer and worship. And even when her prayers were not being answered in the way that she wanted. She kept coming back year after year, showing persevering faith. In verse 7, just before our reading for today starts, it says, this went on year after year. Hannah took time to worship the Lord. At the point of this particular year's trip to the house of the Lord for sacrifices and worship, Hannah was in a particularly low emotional state. Verse 10 says, In her deep anguish, she prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. There are all kinds of places to turn when life disappointments seem like they are too great for us to bear. But Hannah chose with her husband and with sacrifices of worship to come and offer up all of her hurts and all of her heart before the Lord as well. A third lesson from Hannah's heart, you might say, is 
when your heart is broken, give it to God. Now, when you give a broken heart to God, people may not totally understand what is going on with you. It was an intensely emotional time for Hannah as she was laying it all out there, giving it up to God in prayer. Her lips were moving, but she wasn't talking, and the priest Eli thought she was drunk. She allowed the desperation of her situation to drive her to God in prayer in such a way that others looking on may have thought, this is kind of weird. But Hannah didn't care what the people thought. She was focused on God, and she was more and more focused on how things looked to God. And so if Hannah had the chance to pass on some motherly wisdom to us, she might say, don't be afraid to look silly for God. And God heard her prayers, and the priest Eli said, go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you asked of him. And the Lord remembered her, and she gave birth to a son, just as she had prayed for. She had prayed through the valley, and God was faithful to see her through in his mercy, and happened in this case to honor the prayer with what she had asked. What followed is one of the great songs of the Old Testament. That is another blessing by the mothers and with, uh, women of Scripture. They offer great songs of faith that give praise and thanks to God when big events happen in their lives. There are the great songs of Miriam, of Deborah, of Mary in the New Testament, in the Magnificat. And then also in this next chapter here, a song of Hannah after the birth of Samuel. In fact, during Advent in December, you may recall I showed parallels between Mary's Magnificat and Hannah's song as it's shown here. These women knew how to stop and give thanks and praise to God when big things happened. You might say, or Hannah might say, pray through the valleys and praise through the victories. Now here is where Hannah's faith, which has already been really strong through very tough circumstances, meets what we who have been parents might think to be the greatest challenge of all. After all that she had been through, Hannah was to give back to God the very thing that she had most strongly sought after for so long, her son Samuel, given unto the Lord in the service of the house of the Lord, true to her word and to her prayer that she offered to God and that God had honored, after the child was weaned, she brought him to the temple of the Lord to be a servant and an apprentice under the priest Eli. Now, she didn't stop being his mother, but giving him up to the Lord's service meant that she would not see him as much as she would otherwise, and primarily did when they came to the house of the Lord each year for worship and annual sacrifices. And each time she came, she came with a gift for her son. It was a robe that she made for him to wear in the temple in service to the Lord. And as promised, Hannah chose to let him go. She came to recognize there comes a time to let go and to let God in the years that followed with their returns to the house of the Lord for worship, the priest Eli told her husband Elkanah, May the Lord give you children by this woman to take the place of the one she prayed for and gave to the Lord. And Hannah gave birth to three more sons and two daughters. I have always been a little partial to Hannah in this story. Because my mom used to tell me that of all her three children, 
I was the only one that she had prayed Hannah's prayer for before I was born. And I was the one who ended up going into full-time pastoral ministry. And she said she wasn't sure why she only prayed that one for me and not my older brother or younger sister. But I suspect it was because she was in a time of spiritual renewal in her life right then. And then also, sometime after my brother's birth, but before I was conceived, she had suffered the pain of a miscarriage. But like Hannah, she didn't let the disappointments or desperation of life to lead her away from God, but rather toward God. And like Hannah, I believe she knew that God is a God who hears that we should take time to worship the Lord, that when your heart is broken, give it to God, to not be afraid to look silly for God, to pray through the valleys and praise through the victories. And lastly, that there comes a time to let go and let God when it comes to our sons and our daughters And I think this last one was probably the hardest one for her. Our community here at Christ Church is one where there are many extra mother and grandmother figures who are busy serving as Sunday school teachers and Sunday night students supper volunteers. And in many of our missional relationships that are shared with the women's ministries of this church, all of them sharing and demonstrating Christian love to people who sure could use a lot more of it every week. Happy Mother's Day to all the women of the church today with many thanks and special recognition of the many ways that you are sharing Christian love and by God's grace, making the world a better place. I invite the band to come forward as I close in prayer. Lord, your love is unending. Your presence is ever with us, whether we sense it or not. Thank you for being the God who hears us, who sees us, and in mercy reaches to us. Thank you, God, for our homes, for blessing us with them as a place to live, for the people that we are blessed to share life with, both in the home and in our church family and in all of the many friendships and relationships uh, where love is at the center. Please lead us, O God, as we strive to be a people who pray through the valleys and praise through the victories and allow life's uh, circumstances not to drive us from you, but to drive us towards you and to lay it all out before you and to let go and let God. Lead us in that today, O God, with whatever burdens we may be carrying on our hearts today, whether it has to do with children or something else entirely. We entrust our lives to you, for you are God, and you are our Lord, one who loves and sees us through and helps us to persevere. Thank you, Lord God. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.